Warm greetings to you on this second Sunday after the Epiphany in our church calendar. Also, the second Sunday in which we're meeting only virtually with suspended worship on Sundays. I'm glad that we can gather, at least in this way, and we all pray for and look ahead to a time when we hope that's not too far in the future we can regather in person. In the meantime, I'm so glad that you're a part of our worship in this way. And our service is found in the Book of Common Prayer, beginning on page 355 with the opening acclamation. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah, beginning in the 62nd chapter. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, says the Lord, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married for as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall our God, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. Our psalm is Psalm 36, verses 5 through 10 found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 632, Psalm 36, beginning in verse 5, on page 632 in the prayer book. Your Lord, your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the strong mountains, your justice like the great deep, you save both man and beast, O Lord. How priceless is your love, O God! Your people take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They feast upon the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the well of life, and in your light we see light. Continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your favor to those who are true of heart. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. 
and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Nerves at the grocery store were already frayed because of the pandemic. When the customer arrived, he wanted Combazola, a type of blue cheese. He'd been cooped up for a long time. He scoured the dairy area, nothing. He flagged down an employee who also did not see the cheese. He demanded that she hunt in the back and look it up on the store computer. She did, no luck, and then he lost it. Another out of control member of the great chorus of American consumer outrage, 2021 style. So began an article in the New York Times. A store employee quoted in the article, Anna Luna reflected, have you seen a man in his 60s have a full temper tantrum because we don't have the expensive imported cheese he wants? Anna described the mood at her store in Minnesota as angry, confused, and fearful. She added, you're looking at someone and thinking, I don't think this is just about the cheese. Well, by the way, the title of the article said a lot. A nation on hold wants to speak with a manager. Well, we are testy. Some of us, aren't we? Maybe all of us some of the time. No, it's not just about the cheese. It's not about this or that inconvenience. It's, it's about a lot of things. It's about the ways the Omicron virus has worn us down. Some days I'm just mad about the pandemic. Maybe you are too. When I found out that my son Abram and his wife and one of their sons got COVID, I... I felt even a little miffed at God, frustrated. The restrictions, the uncertainties, the changing pandemic guidance, the polarizing, and as the article went on that I started with, political discord has, as the article writer put it, calcified into political hatred. That's all intensified, the mood and the emotional temperature and so, the article said, when, when, people we have, when, when people have to meet each other in transactional settings, in stores, on airplanes, over the phone, on customer service calls, they are sometimes, well, let's just say, not at their best. They're most mature. They're most pleasant. Let's let that little scene in the store, by the way, help us consider how we relate to all people during this time of frustration and short emotional fuses. It's tempting to lash out, berate the poor clerk in front of you, the innocent person on the other end of the line. It's tempting to shout, I wanna to speak to a manager. But if not that, where do you go when you're frustrated? When you've just kinda of had it? We know there's a better way, better way than lashing out. There has to be. Today's gospel reading plunges us into a scene where anxiety is rising fast. Lots of things have become scarce. Well, I should say one thing, one very important thing, and there's an alternative offered and as far as how you react, a wonderful way forward for anyone who's frazzled and at wit's end. You'll see what I mean in a couple of moments, but for now, I'll just give some background. It's a story where this key commodity for any wedding is just, well, it, it gives out. I mean, the wine. And yet you need to know that in that day and time, in Jesus' world, his culture, weddings were grand events with the reception and the celebrating going on and on. Practically everybody in the village would have been there. And while people are having a rollicking good time, well, something goes amiss. That often happens in weddings, I guess. It's the third day, John tells us, and you need to know that wedding celebrations 
in that time went on, well, they could go on for seven days. And here it is, day three, and they're out of wine. It would have been humiliating for the groom, frustrating for the guests. And Jesus, there for all that we can tell, just as an invitee, he seems calm and flustered. Maybe, maybe he's not even noticing. I mean, it's Mary, Jesus' mother, who seems to be the one to notice. She does something really interesting. She already knew something was special about Jesus' identity as Messiah and Son of God. She, she knew that. The angel had told her, and she had plenty of other signs along the way. Without any apology, she turns right to Jesus, and she implores him to revive this wilting party. Uh, Jesus seems to kind of brush her off. The words are spare here, but you could just imagine him saying, woman, what does that have to do with you or me? My hour has not yet come. It's like he's saying, I've got a kingdom after all to bring in. I've got a broken world to heal and to save. And you're worrying me about wine? Still, Jesus tells the manager of the feast to fill up those six stone jars with what amounts to 180 gallons of water. That's all the wine that's going to be needed and then some. It would be a super abundance of wine. More, more than, than any, any guest, more than any host could hope for or, or even worry about needing. Now, the water Jesus transforms isn't just any water. Water stored, or at least the jars were used in this way, for ritual washings prescribed by Old Testament law. The water is symbolic of those rites of purification that were part of the whole Jewish religious order. And the water is symbolic of that old way of doing things, of of, of of treating our rupture in our relationship with God and all of the laws of the temple and the sacrifices. It symbolizes all that the people had in religion up to that point. And all that they had had wasn't enough. We know this because the number six here, the number of jars, that's not accidental. Uh, one scholar, commentator, says the number seven signified completion, perfection in Jewish and early Christian writings. So the presence, not of seven jars, but of six jars, tells us that the old way of doing things is imperfect, incomplete. It doesn't measure up to the fullness. Jesus, we're being reminded and told, is ushering in something new, something better, something different. Here, here, something new and radical is unfolding right before their eyes. Now, the symbolism, the symbol, they, they wouldn't have seen all that at the moment, but the disciples hearing the story, telling the story, John writing up the story for his gospel would have, would have uh, I mean, that symbolism they couldn't have missed. And, and same with the day, the day of the wedding feast and banquet on which the miracle took place, that's important. We're told it's on the third day, the third day of the wedding celebration. Now think about, think about something else important that happens on a third day. I mean, Jesus' resurrection, the third day after his crucifixion. So even now, even now, as John's beginning this gospel, this is just chapter 2, we're looking ahead to his death and coming back to life. Here's yet another hint of Jesus' significance to the whole world, not, not just the turning of water into wine, as amazing a miracle as that is, but, but, but the suggestion of some larger meanings in Jesus' life and, and, and what's going to be on the horizon John tells us that in this miracle, Jesus manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Again, they didn't, they didn't catch it all right then. 
I caught enough to know God was doing something extra special. And that word glory, it's a very important biblical idea. It means God's splendor, God's radiance, his, his amazing goodness. It's just like it shines. That's what glory is. And, and often that word glory refers to a revealing of God's presence. God makes his glory known when his glory, his radiance, is seen or felt or heard. And that's what's happening here. It's the first of Jesus' signs, John says. For John, his first significant public act. That's why we tell this story during Epiphany. This season we're in, it's the third act, I guess you could say, at least as far as the gospel readings, during the season of Epiphany, which is all about signs, showing forth good news, the wonderful possibilities that Jesus brings, not just to Israel, but to the world. This third act at a wedding comes after the arrival, first of the Magi, the wise men. Last Sunday, the second, it would have been the baptism of our Lord. For, John says, through this scene, too, not just those, through this scene, Jesus revealed his glory, made his goodness seen and known vividly. But I want to go back to how I began this sermon with our frustration level high, with our weariness at a pandemic that we thought months ago would be in the rear view mirror by now. When frustrations happen, when disappointments pile up, when something goes wrong in our lives, something we don't understand how do we cope? To where do we turn? Well, an amusement park in Canada has one solution. It's, I guess, maybe not so different from customers that berate innocent retail clerks. Thunderdome Amusements has created what they call a rage room in which guests can relieve stress by smashing things. The facility provides golf clubs, sledgehammers, pipes, baseball bats, so that customers can release their frustration by breaking office equipment and other items. Says the director, you go in to smash stuff, and we provide full-blown full protective gear. You wear face masks, chest protector, coveralls, gloves, and you just go in there and start smashing. And he added, you come out of the room 45 minutes later and you feel better. Guests are also welcome to bring their own items. He said a lot of people with desk jobs are excited to smash printers. Admittance fees begin at about $20 a person. Well, I see a better way, better way than taking out our frustration on others, a better way than smashing things, a better way than pulling back from God or just feeling down, confused. I see a better way in Mary, Jesus' mother. I see a better way in how she instinctively turned to Jesus when something went wrong. She didn't, she didn't know what he would do, not really, yet she trusted in him completely, saying to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Mary turned to God, even when she did not completely understand. Well, we can get caught up, fixated on our wants, our fears, no longer watching for the revealing of God's glory in our lives, our, our hopes, become shrunken, uh, we, we, we stop watching for those signs of God's activity in our life together. In the world, the wider world, we get hemmed in by the bad habits of what Will Williman calls the lifestyle of the anxiously affluent. Because with all of our goods and all of our fulfilled wishes, still, still, feel malaise or frustration. 
the aftertaste of affluence, someone once said, is boredom. Or, or maybe not boredom, maybe frustration. We forget. We forget about God's glory. We forget about a wider world in which God is doing amazing things. In this dramatic, simple story, what happened to avert a crisis at a wedding long ago, it can reorient us, can keep us watching even more intently for ways God's going to show up in our exasperating and exciting world. We take our frustrations to him. We turn to the one who has all the resources and help we can need or want. He came into our midst long ago at a wedding. He comes into our lives and our world, wherever we are. Amen. Let us joyfully affirm our faith, remember the Christ who's come into our midst into our lives and into the wider world. As we say together the Nicene Creed, it's in the prayer book on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the Peoples, Form 4 found in the prayer book on page 388. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, your response is, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, especially Justin, Archbishop, Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, Tim, our rector. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good, especially Joseph, our president, Ralph, our governor, Glenn, our governor-elect, and Dexter, our mayor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We pray for first responders, for all medical workers, and for all who serve in law enforcement and for their families. 
We pray for those serving in the military, Alex, William, Dexter, Jeremiah, Jonathan, David, Cameron, and Byron. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles. Bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray for our vestry and lay ministers, for relatives, friends, members of our parish, for Brenda, Lot, Edwina, Peg, Eli, Kathy, Angela, Tucker, B, Clarence, L.W., Donna, Hilda, Betty, Sue Ann, and Violet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You may add your own petitions and thanksgivings. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Our prayer of confession is found on page 360. We'll begin with a time of silent reflection and confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will walk in your ways to the glory of your name amen almighty god have mercy on you forgive you all your sins through our lord jesus christ strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the holy spirit keep you in eternal life amen so we think about all that god has done for us as we think about a wider world in which we're called to witness and serve, remember these words, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit be among you and those you love now and always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.